Matt Holzaffel, Director of Public Works. And as Chris uh, hands out, we have a draft engineering report as well as uh, the presentation. I'd like to kind of just go over uh, uh, the, the genesis of this engineering report. As you recall, some months back, uh, Council started receiving a number of citizen concerns regarding the uh, optimized concrete uh, pavement reconstruction method being used on our Real Texas Road Residential Street Bond Program. Uh, council did direct staff at that point to uh, find an engineering firm that had uh, experts in pavement design to evaluate uh, the methods being used under uh, that program. We, uh, we looked around, we uh, identified the firm of CPNY uh, who had uh, recognized uh, experts in uh, this particular field of uh, pavement design and we contacted them and asked them to provide a scope of services to uh, look at our pavement reconstruction methods being used uh, for the optimized concrete pavement reconstruction. Um, uh, they, uh, they were told, instructed early on, uh, to take an open and objective look uh, at this process and give us uh, an unvarnished uh, pros and cons on uh, the methods being used. Uh, and to also suggest, uh, if they found issues with the process, to suggest uh, process improvement for the project. Um, we did uh, uh, in, then uh, take a contract uh, to the manager's office, and uh, uh, they, the two primary engineers of CPNY that looked at our roadways are Ralph Brown and Bill Nelson. They'll come up in a second and kind of do a presentation on uh, their findings. Uh, I, I do want to point out this is a draft report. There are elements of the uh, investigation and, and engineering analysis that are not yet complete. Uh, there's a Dr. Lay that is uh, with a university, I believe, of Oklahoma, uh, who is going to uh, do some mathematical analysis of the uh, optimized concrete uh, structural uh, pavement structure and uh, break that down as to uh, the improvements and things of, uh, of uh, that method for concrete pavements. There's also going to be a peer review added to this report uh, by TransTech. Uh, that's part of the, the team. They've not seen the report as yet, so that also has to be added. But we know there's a lot of questions on this report, a lot of questions on the uh, methods uh, that are being used out there. So we wanted to bring this to council in draft form. Uh, so that you can see where we're at. And I, I think you'll find that it is a very open uh, and honest and objective look at the process, uh, and it, look, it does look at both pros and cons. And with that, I'd like to bring up uh, both Ralph and uh, Ralph Brown and Bill Nelson to take a look at this. One more. There we go. Oh, thanks, you Matt. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Matt. Uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Bill Nelson. There's pictures in there. You can tell which of us is which. Uh, as Matt said, uh, they were directed to bring in a firm with some expertise in pavement design and, and analysis. And to that end, uh, city staff has asked us to give you a little bit of our backgrounds, and uh, neither Ralph nor I is comfortable really talking about ourselves, so we're going to talk about each other. Uh, so to start out with, uh, Ralph Brown. Uh, Ralph, Ralph and I have worked with that together at TxDOT for many years, and he brought me in to CPNY. Uh, I, he thought maybe I was getting bored building fences for my wife. Uh, but uh, said, Ralph has Ralph uh, Ralph has over 30 years of uh, both highway design, construction, and research experience. He is a very accomplished technical expert. Uh, he has a strong construction background. Uh, he is very adept at quoting you the equations and the coefficients involved in analyzing structures. Um, that's not me. Uh, so we kind of play off each other, but uh, he is a subject matter, man, subject matter expert in multiple areas of highway construction and design. 
uh, as some examples. Uh, Ralph served as the as TxDOT's bridge division construction engineer for a period, and while he was in that position, he was a subject matter expert for thin bonded bridge deck overlays, which is not unlike the optimized pavement reconstruction or rehabilitation process. Uh, the bridge decks looked more at epoxies, latex modified concretes, and dense concretes because a bridge has more flexure than pavement on the ground. But uh, again, Ralph, Ralph is very fluent in this area. He worked for seven years as the North Tarrant County Area Engineer. Uh, he worked not only on TxDOT highways, but he also worked with 24 different municipalities in the north, northern part of Tarrant County. Uh, some, of what, some of his research he was involved in, one was alternatives to asphalt concrete sub-bases for concrete paving. That research project led to the, uh, was that the Highways for Life grant through the FHWA? Yes, sir. Uh, he, that also led to the development of the optimized graded concrete research for the Oklahoma DOT. And out of that came something called the tarantula curves for aggregate selection. And I'm going to try to keep Ralph from getting into that because he will become Professor Brown if I do that. So <laughs> with that, I'm going to let him introduce you a little bit about me. All right. Thank you, Bill. And, and that job at TxDOT, I, I, I drew the short straw on that, so I got uh, stuck with all the thin bonded work. It was a, a lot of fun. Uh, Bill, <laughs> Bill, is, uh, Bill was uh, the uh, Wise County Area Engineer. We worked together quite a bit at TxDOT. Uh, Bill uh, was utilized to uh, lead implementation of new highway projects and products, particularly pavements and, uh, and, and some weird bridges. Uh, and so, as those, uh, Bill was very good at being at, at practical implementation, and would would call baloney, using the right adjective when uh, when things weren't going right and didn't look well. And Bill Bill brings that practical aspect of what we're doing out here, and uh, and challenges us when we do have uh, uh, stuff that doesn't look right and wants. Uh, uh, w wants to investigate those answers, and he brings that that success to the project. And so, so I really like uh, having Bill on on the job. And he's, uh, if you remember the the horizontal drilling, which started it started out in Wise County in the Barnett shells, and they saw an enormous load put on those roads out there, tearing those roads up. And Bill was part of the solutions and uh, the, those pavement improvements out there to stop those pavements from failing. And, uh, and so with that, I really appreciate his, uh, his uh, involvement in this project and help. Let's talk about what's going on right now here. So, okay. You just alluded to it, but I just wanted to clarify before we go much further. So y'all have done some previous third-party type reports before on um, processes that were had concerns or where there was questions about. Is this have y'all done this before? I wouldn't call it third-party reports. It was while both of us were at TxDOT, we were investigating new technologies that were being proposed for use on TxDOT projects. Okay, so, so you've done some oversight of other projects yes. like this before. Okay. Yes. Thank you so much. Well, and, and this is a unique project, so so I don't want to don't want to imply that it is not unique. So so um, so looking at this, you know, it's an innovative uh, approach to rehabbing the uh, residential concrete streets, uh, your your pavements. It's been when you look at that PCI index, a grade one pavement is 85 or better, a grade four is 56 or less. This thing has been utilized or this process has been utilized on those pavements with a score of 56 or less. Uh, one of the unique aspects of this, uh, of this method is that you know, with, with, with TxDOT on our pavement designs, 
uh, the, we put our steel right in the middle, and, and it was put there to try to hold the, the cracks together and stop them from expanding or contracting, and, uh, and it was just meant to hold the cracks together. Uh, this design adds a little bit of steel in the top tensile zone, and it can help resist some flexual, uh, flexual cracking that occurs. Uh, the, the city uh, implementing this project has uh, done point repairs. If they know they already have a, a piece of pavement that has failed, they'll go out and repair it before this process is used. They also address the drainage and make sure that drainage is functional before the job is done. Uh, we, we've milled the, the uh, surfaces two inch at the curbs, and that's very thin, and it, it is thin. And, uh, and they, they've added that reinforcing and, and the, um, the concrete at the center line is at three inches. So th the challenge with it is, will it bond? The, at, at two inches, will it bond? And one, one of the things the city engineers have utilized is these tarantula curves or optimized graded concrete design. And what's, basically, it's gone back to what your grandfather's concrete was. Pack as much rock as you can into concrete, the, the least amount of paste and, uh, and sand, and it cuts your shrinkage by about 50%. So one of the challenges or one of the, the interesting things is by reducing that shrinkage, it allows you to develop that thin bond on the edge. And we're seeing, we're seeing, uh, we're seeing that happen on this job. So, so uh, another thing that's very unique here, and both Bill and I worked as, uh, as owners and when we utilize consultant engineers to design and manage the projects, we're, we're looking at a 16% increase in the cost of the projects, 8% design, 8% approximately to uh, administer the contract. Uh, and so uh, with, with your staff doing that, you're seeing that recovery or that money going back into the process. So it's, it's really interesting to see that, that recovery of those assets and it being put back into the uh, into the uh, roadway. Um, right now, on the uh, on the projects that are being utilized, we're looking at a almost a sixty-six dollars per square foot uh, cost. Square Say what? Square yard. I mean square yard. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> that would be really expensive. <laughs> did I hit the wrong button? I did. And, and so, so understand that that optimized design is at sixty-six dollars a square a, a square yard. I worked on the Forney jobs after I retired from TechStot. We used a different design method for the payments called a PVR design. It 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 the payment design ended up with a ten-inch reinforced concrete pavement. We had one inch of asphalt, six inches of flex base and 30 inches of line stabilization. That was done on FM 548, FM 740, FM 741, and 40. We had to dig out 47 inches of subgrade to build that pavement to achieve a one inch potential vertical rise. My point on that is if we went with a very bulletproof design here, the, the minimum the cost of this is $161 a square square yard today. So when you compare the system that's being utilized right now to a bulletproof design, you're getting about three miles of repair done versus one mile of the uh, Forney work that, uh, <coughs> that I performed with, uh, uh, with, with KBR. <sighs> It's being an Aggie. You know, one of the things we didn't add into all this is, uh, is the utility relocations on the job. You know, you know, utilities are under all your roads. Guys, if we had to shove those to the side, if we had to try to work around them, that's going to add an enormous amount of cost to the job. Uh, the inconvenience to the residents uh, would be, you know, could be enormous. My, uh, my, mother, uh, my mother had to use uh, one of those air machines to uh, to breathe and uh, and it, it never happened, but I could not imagine if we'd lost access to to her uh, when she was having to use that air machine. And so we were able to get her in a nursing home and take care of it. But but when she was at home, she had some of those 
uh, health challenges. And, uh, and I thought what was very interesting here is e you can reconstruct this, and if you have residents that do have health challenges, they still have access to their homes, and they're not going to have to re relocate while that's going on. Okay. All right, Bill. I will okay. back off and let you talk. All right. Um, end of April, first part of May, I did some driving surveys of all four neighborhoods that have been had the uh, optimized pavement rehab process used to date. And um, if I saw areas that had a significant distress, as I'm calling it, I would get out and do a walking survey and get a little more information on it. Uh, the, the, fir the first takeaway is that looking at the numbers and evaluating the condition of pavements, um, this is a innovative method of rehabilitating pavement and there was expectations that there would be locations that had to be go had to go back and and readdress uh, as we said it's it, this is not a bulletproof design and it, it is innovative there's a learning curve on it but uh, my observations uh, approximately 94 percent success rate and what I mean by that Adding up the numbers, about 1.7, 1.8 miles out of the 31 plus miles where this process has been used, I did identify what I thought was an, a, higher than, a higher than expected amount of some type of distress. So applying the numbers, as I said, a 94% success rate, actually higher than the original expectations when the program was begun. And the program did include provisions I mean, there, there was an expectation, there were provisions that it may have to go back and make some repairs, rework some areas. So we're, we're actually currently, we're, we're in better shape than the original expectations. Now, what's happening out there? And I've got just some bullet points on here. The report that you've been given has photographs and details and it gives street locations where, of what I observed when I was, when I was doing my surveys. Uh, the five types of distresses that I've listed there. Shrinkage cracking. Uh, the optimized concrete design that Ralph was talking about does a lot to improve this, to reduce the shrinkage cracking. And that, physical, that means that physically, as the concrete cures, either through temperature conditions, wind, low humidity, or excess water in the concrete, as that water comes out of the concrete, the concrete shrinks. And it has to go somewhere, so when it does that, it can open up cracks. Um, that's, one, that's one thing that can happen. How do you address that to keep it from happening? You pay attention to your concrete design. You also look at the, the weather and other conditions when you do your installations. Uh, so those are processes. Uh, if you have excess reflective cracking, and I do say excess because you're going to have re reflective cracking. Um, Concrete does flex, and again, in the report, it gives a little more detail about how it does and why you get these types of cracks. Typically, that's the transverse cracks you see going across the pavement. Um, what you can do to reduce that, provide subgrade support and leveling. Uh, you can make some modifications to your design, and the city, is, the city staff is pursuing that with the contractor. The subgrade support and the leveling is done under other contracts in the Real Texas Roads program. So the city staff is trying to identify those locations and address them in advance. Stress cracking is simply where there is poor support under the pavement and because it's, it, it's only two to three inches thick so it does flex and it can develop what's called alligator cracking in an area. How do, you, how, do you, how do you address that? You support that subgrade, and then when necessary, when, it's, when the, sub, when the so supporting pavement is in too bad a shape, you repair that area before you come in and do the overlay. Uh, debonding really is one of, has, has been one of our largest concerns, we thought, going into this. Again, we have five inches of concrete down today. We're putting two to three inches on top of it. As long as the top and bottom layers bond together, We've now got a seven to eight inch thick pavement. It's going to perform much better. If they don't bond together, you've, it's like two sheets of plywood on top of each other. I mean, eventually that top layer is going to break up. So debonding, going into it, we thought would be our biggest concern. 
uh, sheer failures. That is simply before you go on. Yes, sir. So, so with that, how do we? And I'm not an engineer at all, but how do we have a good idea going into that, having a good feel or a firm foundation that it is going to be okay concrete that we're putting on top of versus a not stable concrete? Uh, the best approach is going to be experienced staff uh, observing and managing what the contractor is doing. Uh, for them to know what needs to be out there, what they need to look for, for them to be able to identify this has deteriorated too much, we need to pull this out, and I think the city has done a pretty good job, I think the staff has done a pretty good job of doing that in advance. There are occasions where you just don't see it, and that falls into that 6% where we're saying it was not successful. Okay, thank you. I might add, Councilman Archer, from when we first started, our staff has now taken out almost four times as much full depth repair in these in these areas that we feel that the subgrade has failed or in, is not properly supporting the pavement. Uh, there, but, but if you look through the report, there's a whole lot of detail on how to read cracks, okay, and that takes some experience. Those cracks are like fingerprints for us. It tells us what's going on with the pavement and the subgrade underneath it. It does require experienced staff and experienced inspectors. And so as they're developing that experience, they're realizing, you know, this didn't work on the, the streets we did last year. We, we need to up how much pavement we're taking out and, and completely replacing it as a full depth before we start our overlay process. And so we are doing more of that type of work, almost four times as much with the streets we're doing today versus when we first started. So if I can just clarify what you just said, from the start of this, with all of us hoping we would be able to do lots more non-depth replacement. Uh, since we've been going through and double-checking this and looking at this closer, you're saying that we have found some areas where uh, otherwise we would not have, but to, to go in and do that full depth replacement because we're learning as we go with this process, et cetera. Is that kind of? That is correct, okay. sir. We, we are, this is an evolving process. We're learning. Okay. We are, as they're detailing, we've already started negotiations with the contractor on things we think need to be improved in order to uh, improve that success rate on the pavement we're putting we're down. we're giving them some education as well? I absolutely, guess. sir. Okay. I hate to interrupt, but these are no, absolutely parts right here. Thank you so much. So, Thank so, you. So, so, so part of that is cleanliness. And so, so there's some ways to enhance cleanliness. Blowing, you know, blow, once, they, once they clean the pavement uh, it, and, and uh, uh, clean the pavement with water, they can blow that also uh, off that pressure wash. But, but the other thing is watching the concrete design and making sure that those gradations don't change because not all rock is crushed the same. So we've got to check that concrete design to make sure it stays optimized. And, and as it falls out, we've got to make, redesign it and adjust it. And so that's, that, that's one of the processes that needs to take place. It's, it's just going back to what our granddads did. The more rock, the better. This is, this is where Ralph gets into the analysis and prevention, and I go out on the ground and say, hey, is it working? And what can we do to, what can we do to make it better? Um, to go to on to the next one on here, uh, what are the risks with the optimized pavement re re rehabilitation? Uh, we identified three basic categories, and we want to look at either what causes it or how, again, how can we address it to improve the results? Uh, the first thing is if we have structural or subgrade issues that, are, that aren't addressed in advance. Um, that causes a lack of support uh, because you've got severe deterioration of the pavement that maybe wasn't seen. And as Mr. Hallsapple has said, they, they're getting better at identifying those, catch those in advance. Where, where you had assumed you would be spending about 10% of your funds perhaps on having to go back and fix things. We can catch it up front. We can spend some more of that money up front. We reduce the repairs on the back end. Um, and, and certainly the, the traveling public would much rather see you come in once, do it, and not have to come back. So there's a major convenience factor there to, to spend that money up front where it's appropriate. Uh, Generally, those failures are addressed during the payment evaluations, and again, that goes back to having experienced staff. 
Uh, even the staff that you have with what experience they had, as, you, as Mr. Halsapple said, they're learning more each on each project, on each neighborhood that they do. Um, it requires that some work be coordinated with the city crews to address water issues and the other RTR contracts to do leveling where necessary. Leveling, they're doing by polyurethane injection, and that will also stabilize weak subgrades as well. So it can be used for a twofold purpose there. But that work is being coordinated through the other RTR contracts. Um, second mode of failure or the second risk that we looked at was a failure of the OPR concrete overlay to properly bond. And as Ralph has said, that requires adequate inspection during the milling process, but more than anything, it requires clean concrete when the overlay is applied. If there's, if there's been a diesel spill or anything, that has to be cleaned off, and that's why we actually recommend pressure washing of those areas. Excess water is a problem as well. That's why we also say blow it, after, blow it before you pour the concrete. When we, when we would pour a bridge deck, we had uh, precast panels, and that's, that's a major method of pouring bridges, building bridges today. It was important that those panels be damp, but not have a lot of standing water, because the standing water interferes with the bond of your concrete. Same, same thing applies here. Uh, as Ralph also said, regular evaluation of the concrete design to, to assure that your design is still, is still meeting, meeting your gradation requirements. The third risk is excessive heavy traffic. Now this one is hard to do anything about because the neighborhoods are what they are. Um, commercial and school access areas are really the primary concern here and it was, and out of that 1.77 miles that I identified in my surveys, the majority of those areas were high traffic areas, specifically looking at heavy vehicles. I got um, a question. Go ahead and finish. Oh, go ahead. Okay. Go ahead and finish what you're saying. Okay. All right. Um, it, it's detailed in the report more, uh, but to give you an example, a garbage truck weighs about 55,000 pounds. A pickup truck weighs about 6,000 pounds. That's about a nine to one weight difference, weight weight ratio. The actual impact of the, on the pavement of a garbage truck is actually more on the order of 600 times because it is a heavier load being applied, not a lighter repetitive load. So it, because that's the nature of the traffic, it may simply have to enter into the city using that as part of their selection process for which roads to apply this on. In some cases, it may simply have to say this is going to require a complete reconstruction instead of the overlay. As we said, we're going to give you our honest opinion on this. So. And, and I appreciate that. So. I'm going to ask questions, and I'm trying to understand this okay. issue. Um, I'm not, I don't have a point other than I'm trying to figure out exactly this element of it. And that is, let's say that with, with the optimized uh, process, we're as successful as we can be. We've identified the underlying previous spots. Um, when we needed full depth, we've been proactive and we've replaced proactive areas, but let's say we've done adequate inspection, cleanliness of concrete, poor regular evaluation, so we're catching everything proactive. We laid a, the two to three inches of the OPR on top, and let's say that we've been optimal in our bonding. Why, in your opinion, should that road still fail with commercial and heavy traffic, um, why is that still a failure situation that may cause us to have to have like a heavier PSI and a heavy and a heavier depth uh, for concrete inch? Okay, so but but in when I'm wrong, please. Okay. So uh, so these are Houston clays, right? And and we don't know what the subgrade. Uh, how it was treated before, prior. My assumption is it's a cog design with six inches of pavement and maybe eight inches of lime underneath. Mm -hmm. I don't know if they used lime when these subdivisions were built. And so we can go through and do everything right, but if that subgrade and, and being a nerd, they call it K value, if it's low, uh, it, heavy loads are going to cause it to fail. And we, we can't 
fix the subgrade. But, but I mean, there are, I shouldn't say we can't, there are options. We can go in, in, in a normal house is designed where your grade beams are on 10 foot centers. We can go in there and we can cut uh, beams down the road. We can, we can put reinforced concrete in those beams, pour them in place, attach the, uh, attach the pavement to the top of that. We have one risk. As we get uplift, that uplift can rip that pavement off of those beams. But it's a risk. We can do the math and see how much uplift would cause that to happen. The point is, it's, that's a very expensive repair process. But, but, if, it's, but if it's identified, we, we, we do have an option there. So let me, let me repeat this so that I'm trying to make sure I understand what you're saying. You're saying in heavy traffic areas, garbage trucks, school buses, things like that, a regular residential road has the risk of failure, even if we do everything right. And so we need to reevaluate where we put a regular residential road and maybe build a better road in those select areas instead of depending upon a regular residential road, even if everything's done right, to succeed? If you, if you were building everything new, then I would, re I, I would recommend in those areas, you know, a boulevard in front of a school in a commercial area, I would recommend a beefed up pavement section over your standard residential. So, For so that can, very reason, so, it will deteriorate so, under that heavy so, so can we go back? Can we go back to that, that slide I had presented? And so this is, uh, go back one more. So economic analysis, right, right, right now, so we're at $66 a square yard. Okay, go to the next. And, and, and this is the other thing. Your, your staff is saving you 16%. So, so, which is, you know, you hire me, I'm going to give you this design because then there's no risk. Right. But your staff is taking that risk and giving you that, I don't know, is it a $100 million? Pro, uh, 120. 120. I mean, you're looking at $20 million there for, for repairs just because your staff is capable of doing this. They didn't hide behind somebody. They said, we'll go out there. We'll take the risk. And so, it, Mr. And Brown. So, Mr. Brown. Can we get you back to the microphone just so oh, we can oh, make sorry. sure we get it's this a, on? I'm sorry. It, so, 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 so when you look at the economic analysis of it, the, the, the process that Christina and Matt put in place, you're doing three miles versus one. And, and so the other kind of cool thing about it is this, is your inspectors are very, very good at picking this stuff up. And so if you hired me, I'm going to do a bunch of investigation out there, and that cost is going to be tremendous to find these problems. If under, if under construction they can recognize these and, and correct it, it's very economical. And so it's, it's when we have to come back, it hurts, but it, it's still, when I look at the economics, it's very economical. Right, so. and, and, and I appreciate that. I just want to say, I'm, I, I mean, I understand the risk-benefit cost discussion of this three to one and having a, a certain percentage of failures built into that. I understand that. I got that. You, okay. you don't have to. So, 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 so there's so some I'm other not, things we can do. To, 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 no, no, it's no, okay. <laughs> All I was focused yes. on is it's what it sounds like is, is in our future selection process for where we put the optimized paving um, that we should not put it in heavy traffic areas because we're almost um, uh, building in a much higher or an almost guaranteed failure rate. And in those areas, we need to build a much more substantial road from the get-go. That's right? in our conclusion, yes, sir. Based, yeah, based, based on our observations so far, yes, sir. Okay. Yes. And that should be also a part of our evaluation for selection process. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Got it. it, it and it's, we've jumped our final conclusions, but... <laughs> That's in there. Yes, sir. All right. Let me run back to where we were, and Ralph is going to take over on this, and he's going to talk about our conclusions and recommendations. So, so, so it, 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 it's, <laughs> it's an innovative, uh, it's, 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 it's an innovative right. approach. <laughs> it's, it's, we're, we're seeing what we've seen your staff do. It, it's, it's, we see a 
94% success rate out of it. Uh, it's, it's, it's getting better as, as it's being produced. The, the inspectors are understanding what's necessary. They're, uh, they're improving that process. Uh, your staff is also understanding what they need to improve that process. What we did recognize was on these, on these roads that we just discussed where we have heavy loads, uh, it, it's really not, we, we need to relook at that. There's different ways in, we, we talk about a couple ways to try to enhance that load carrying ability in the report, but you're absolutely right and we've, we've seen that also. And uh, w one of the bigger issues is water. And it, if we have groundwater and it's causing swell, it just, it, it's, it's cracking it. And if, if we've got water meters that aren't addressed, we found one on Farley, we're just out there looking, we had swell occur, the pavement's cracked, water's coming out of the crack, Bill walked over to the water meter and the water meter's full of water. And so that, that you know, addressing that, those leaks as they occur, the faster the better for the pavement. And so, so I think, you know, it's, working great on the residential streets at this time. I think, you know, trying to improve the process and put a little more emphasis on inspection in the field. We'll look at the concrete designs and evaluate those routinely. And, uh, and then on high traffic streets, we need, to, we need to look at those and have other options. You know, I, I appreciate that and, and I appreciate Councilman Miklos talking about the high traffic areas. Because we noticed that some inspection we drove around where we did it close to a shopping center and you realize trucks are delivering in un all day long, mm -hmm. well, it's kind of, no, I hate to say no-brainer, but you know, you realize that's, that's a heavy load truck that's sitting there every day probably. I, I would ask city manager, now he's sitting right here, but I think we've been doing this before we started putting it on residential streets and some other areas, or no? As in using this process, uh, I think Matt can speak to our history with uh, with regards to our some uh, some experimentation and testing that we've used on this project. The reason I asked that before you speak, Matt, because you talk about high traffic areas, and I hope you address this. I'm not trying to set you up, but no. we've got some areas that are kind of fringe on industrial where we've used this for panels of replacement that are being driven on by heavy trucks. Every day service center. Oh. I'm wondering if we've not had the chance to look at those that maybe before they get out of town, they might have a chance to look at those panels as well. So. We can direct them uh, to Kearney Street where we've just completed some. Uh, we did try it, I think some of you uh, have seen, we tried some of it on Townies Boulevard in the industrial area, uh, south of Forney Road and north of Forney Road. That did not work out so well. Uh, we, we did have some failures. I mean, it, it, it just, and it was quite frankly, Pushing the process to the limit, we knew it, we were experimenting, it, it, it did not work there. So our, our own findings uh, are, correspond very well to what they're seeing. When you have that heavy traffic, the heavy loads from semi-trailers and things of that nature or trash trucks, it can lead to lots of distress. Part of our issue is we, we try and stretch the, the taxpayer's money as far as we can and paying for two inches of concrete or three inches of concrete on a road rather than a full depth eight to ten inch panel replacement, we can spread that money a lot more. Now, does it have a higher risk of failure? Absolutely, but with our current budget for materials and the condition of the streets, we're trying to stretch that money as, as far as possible. We have experimented with the, the uh, optimized concrete in alleys and other areas of the city for over a decade actually, and that's kind of how our street superintendent, Mark Hodges, came about that because we've been doing this in select areas all over the city for many, many years, and it's held up very well. Now, we're, we're again, we're stretching that process, using it in heavier load areas, and, and we're gonna probably have to pull back in certain areas where we think, ah, we, we, we pushed it to the limit here. There are certain applications in the residential areas, normal residential traffic, it seems to be working very well. When we get into the higher loads, higher volume traffic, we probably need to dial it back a little bit. Uh, thank you, Mayor. I hate to continue to interrupt this very important briefing, but I wanted to just ask real quick, in regards to this concept of, you know, perhaps neighborhoods that aren't typically supposed to have a lot of truck traffic, 
it's better to have that process there versus a, a commercial road. Uh, it does come to my mind, you know, things like garbage trucks in neighborhoods where they don't have uh, alleys. You know, that concerns me a little bit. I don't know if, if Matt wants to offer a thought on that. Or, uh, that's that's kind of on my mind. Part of what you, you heard mentioned, we have these clay soils and the issue with moisture. Uh, just like we had a rain today, when clay gets wet, and saturated, it turns, you know, you walk in it, you sink up uh, to your ankles nearly, it, it loses all support whatsoever. And that typically occurs on the edges of the pavement. So where you have a trash truck entering an alley where the wheel load is very close to the edge of the pavement and that, that pavement is resting on a saturated clay soil, that's where you start having issues. And so it's, it's real important that we look at those type of areas and maybe do a full depth replacement at like alley approaches, street approaches, major uh, commercial driveways, things like that. And once the truck gets out and it's, you know, trash trucks generally drive down the middle of the residential street because we have parking on either side of the, of the street if they're handling that. They're not giving those edge loads next to that saturated clay uh, in the parkway area. So if we can keep the trash trucks in the middle where the pavement underneath is generally dry, where we, we monitor it for, you know, leaky uh, water mains or services or things of that nature, uh, making sure that our subgrade uh, stays dry. It's another reason we, we're trying to, you know, do something with the trees that are planted right next to the edge of uh, curbs and areas, because that also affects our moisture uh, in those soils. So we're doing what we can to uh, isolate the areas where we have issues with moisture, issues with edge loading, and maybe we need to try a full depth repair in those particular areas, sir. And, and, you, and you, touched, you touched on what was said earlier, and, and I think a number of us around this table have had our share of complaints about uh, water leaks, et cetera. Um, so I'm, I'm understanding that that is also contributing to some of the issues here and there. Absolutely. And, and, and I know it can't be easy, but does your staff already have some preliminary strategy on this in terms of the leak issues and whatnot? We're always monitoring. Our, the number of calls we get in at our utility dispatch center is over 20,000 a year. A lot of those have to do, the vast majority are leaks and small leaks like meters leaking, services leaking, things of that nature. We, tr we try and prioritize that. How badly is it leaking? Uh, because some leaks are obviously higher volume than others and we, we need to get to those quicker. Uh, but we eventually address all leaks in the city. Two more questions. Were the, um, the leaks issue something that we kind of considered or factored into this early on? Or was that something that kind of took us by surprise? And then the second question is, um, uh, well, I just forgot my second question, so it'll come back to me. So answer the first question, please. Sorry. It, definitely. The, the, the effects of the moisture are something we didn't see it as being as huge of a problem as it, it apparently is. So we're, per their report, we are going to uh, have some sit-down training with our inspectors uh, and, and uh, get them to look for these things. Uh, also, the, the cleanliness of the pavement before the overlay is, is applied. Generally, they're doing a real good job with that, but as you wash this off, we, we kind of build a lip when we grind it down right next to the curb, and some of that material is kind of collecting there, and I, it seems like we're not doing the, the job we should in making sure that is absolutely clean. We're also looking at wet curing, putting plastic over the concrete, uh, especially during like these summer months when we get uh, hot weather, hot drying winds. We want to keep that moisture in the concrete so it cures and gains strength because we're putting traffic on these things uh, after three days and seven days. So we want to get maximum cure. So we are talking with the, the contractor about what would it take to literally cover it with plastic for three to seven days after the overlay is applied uh, to get a, a moist cure on those things and gain the maximum strength reduce that shrinkage cracking to make sure we have the, the, the best bond with the existing concrete we can possibly get. Thank you. My second question just came back to me. The second question was, is or are those leak issues often due to us just you know, being an older suburb with a lot of older infrastructure? Absolutely, sir. Um, part of it is on the private side, you know, from the meter to the house. It's owned by the, the private property owner if there's a leak there. 
uh, there can be a real issue, uh, and we have to rely on the prop notifying the property owner and making sure that they take corrective action. It can be a leaky sprinkler system. Uh, irrigation systems are notorious for leaking over time. The valves don't close uh, fully, and you just get a constant drip out of various heads that cause the subgrade in those parkway areas to get uh, super saturated. So there are a number of factors, uh, both uh, on the city's part and in our infrastructure, but also on, uh, on uh, the private side of the meter as well. Matt, I appreciate that, and I want you to know that my questions here are not to uh, be critical of you or your staff or to second-guess us. Um, I think all of us at this table, you know, these are, we're in some territory we haven't been in before. Uh, we're doing some things that older suburbs have to do to renew. Yes, sir. And I don't think you've been on this council, even the mayor, I don't think we're a part of a large road bond program in the past. And so these questions are just so our residents can understand as many details as possible as to how we got here and how we move forward. So I appreciate you sharing that information with us. You bet, sir. Gentlemen. Next steps. Is that what the next slide is? Yep. Thank you. That's mine? That's yours. It's mine? Okay. <laughs> Great. Well, I didn't mean to throw you under the bus on the uh, leaky uh, <laughs> services. Uh, also, if there's groundwater, groundwater is going to create that same challenge as the services that we, we didn't mention. So our next steps is, is, is find ways to optimize the process, find ways to improve uh, the, the success rate out here. Uh, we, we, we know, we've talked about them, water, groundwater. Uh, uh, if it's a heavy loaded street, we probably look at different ways of of, of rehabilitating that street. Uh, the uh, cleanliness is important. Making sure we have enough staff out there so they can look at the look at the 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 the, the pavement that we're rehabbing and make sure it is not fractured and and getting it repaired. They're doing that and uh, and. We're going to go through and do some mathematical analysis, looking at this extra layer of steel we're adding to it and how much that's going to help with uplift uh, as those pavements or as those soils uh, expand. That, that should help us with a little uplift and, and resistance to cracking. Uh, we'll, uh, we'll, uh, and then once we get the math complete, uh, we will send it to Transtech for a peer review and Transtech uh, they, they focus on pavements for the FHWA, so it'll be interesting analysis for them. Very good. Thank you, gentlemen, for running through this. We have, I trust I have one, any questions. Yeah. One question. <clears throat> so on the heavier traffic areas, if we were to grind down and go to a four and a three inch, is that going to be better? I mean, even though we're cutting out that more, it, to keep that top layer from breaking, I mean, just adding an inch either way is, I mean, I know it's it's more cost, but it's not full depth replacement. So, so, so the, ch the challenge is the subgrade. It, it, it's not the pavement. It's, okay. the, it's the subgrade. And so it, if we have a pavement that's experienced a lot of heavy loads in this, these Houston clays, uh, we can do lime injection. We can... I mean, there's a lot of options. We could add thickness, but the problem with adding, a, when I say thickness, I mean six inches, not, not what, what we're doing right here. And with that, we impact our drainage and our tie-ins, and so we can add edge beams like we talked about earlier. Mm -hmm. We have that challenge with uplift. So there's options, but there's always a risk with those options, and so... So those, that's something that your staff would evaluate and present to you what the risks and rewards were on those options and what those costs are. Thank and, you, sir. And we're, you know, we're consultants. We'll always help. So. <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir. All right. Thanks, you all. Yes, sure, yes. Somebody ahead. else have a question. I want to get you guys out of here. I know I appreciate you all coming here today. We want you all you're welcome here, and we appreciate all the work and the efforts. Um, a few questions. Some of this may be for y'all, maybe for staff. Um, what? Just a lot of our residents were very antsy about, you know, when we would get this report. I was just kind of curious, as, you know, why the it took so long to get the report. Uh, I don't. When did we get the go ahead on it? So I mean, 
just a lot to do? It, it took a while to get the contract executed, but they are, quite frankly, about six weeks over on the contract time. It's just you've seen the construction. I, I, virtually every engineering uh, project we have, as well as construction project, with the exception of Syene Road, is uh, behind schedule. Syene Road is blowing and going. but. Uh, that's kind of a product it's almost a highway type job because there's just not much traffic out there so it, it's just workload really okay. and, and stay there Matt if you would yes sir and I've talked to Mr. Kahili about this today as we were driving through Northridge uh, that far end where some we talked about some of the issues with the slurried curbs and, and sidewalks that we weren't so happy with and and I'm I'm satisfied that we were we were new at doing some things and learning as we went I just want to put my two cents in that as we go forward, we really do have a good process or plan in place of when we're going to replace a curb or a sidewalk versus maybe it just needs a little bit of the slurry because what we don't want to do is have an area where it looks like we were supposed to have replaced, but we just slurried a lot and it looks really rough a few weeks later. So I just want to make sure we provide that confidence for our residents. I, I agree entirely. It, you know, um, putting paint on it, is not the way to solve the problem. It's uh, we certainly everybody wants the aesthetics to improve, but uh, as an engineer, uh, we want to actual uh, actually affect the subgrade. We actually want to affect the pavement. We want to repair the curb and sidewalks that are damaged and need uh, repair. And I couldn't agree more. Hey, don't sir. get me wrong. I know we're trying to spread. We're trying to do a lot for a little. And, and I'm. There may be some areas where a little slurry will will piece it up for a while, so I don't want to get away from that. Uh, but I just want us to be careful of how we make those decisions. Um, and the last, uh, I guess the last question I have, maybe it's for Mr. Kahili. Will this report, once completed, will we have this online for our residents to, to look at? Yes, sir. Uh, we will um, package uh, this presentation along with uh, uh, the uh, peer review uh, along, and uh, the final report once it's uh, once it's published and complete, we just wanted to get to this point to present to you the initial findings, and then uh, we'll follow up with a presentation once the peer review uh, is done. Well, I, again, I appreciate all the work that's gone to this, and let's just please keep finding where we're failing and, and keep getting better. I know you guys will, and again, thank you so much. And this is an open-ended question. I, I, I don't have any clue what the answer will be. Uh, I'm wondering. Um, it sounds like... Um, with the OPR, if we're going to have a failure, we're going to have it pretty quickly. Is that a fair statement or not? If we put OPR over uh, uh, an area that was underlyingly failing, or if we didn't do the process correctly, we didn't clean it up correctly, or didn't do it sufficiently to have adequate bonding with the uh, underlying concrete, that's pre-existing, then our failure is going to show pretty quick. Is that generally what you're saying? I think that that's correct. Uh, you know, there's always traffic on these these areas, and if the subgrades fail and you put traffic on top of it, it's gonna it's gonna start deflecting and delaminating and cracking. Have a pattern of cracking that is indicative of a, of a uh, structure failure. So and that's, and that's going to happen pretty quick. And that's also true of the heavy traffic areas. Heavy traffic areas put that uh, um, weight and tension on a road that is, and I hate to use this word, I'm not meaning anything by it other than just for factual purposes, inadequate PSI and depth to handle it regardless of how it was, correct? And that's why that road will start failing fairly quickly. Yeah, at the, that, that subgrade under there is failing. You're, you're, you're adding that stress, that PSI, to that subgrade that can't support it. And so, so as you overload that pavement, it's going to give somewhere. And so, so the, the, the big issue is that combination of of a soft subgrade with a heavy load, and it as yeah, the the traffic will show us that pretty quickly. That's so, so the, the what I'm trying to get at, the, what and I don't know. Do you have any concern about, I guess, the five-year mark and the ten-year mark 
with wear and tear, like normal residential road and normal residential traffic wear and tear on this process where it, it didn't fail in six months, it didn't fail in a year, but at the seven year mark or the eight year mark through wear and tear, because it is less inches and it is less PSI, that that somehow maybe we get a certain percentage instead of 6%, we're talking 15 or 20 or 25 percent failure rate at the seven-year mark, or is that unlikely from your experience? So it's all about the subgrade again, and so it's it it could be progressive if you have saturated subgrade. If we have a very rainy year, you're going to see a higher failure rate than a dry year, and so so it's it, it's all about the subgrade. It's all about that subgrade's. So, so basically, so. we could go through five or six years and not have subgrade expansion with this clay soil that we have. And on year seven, we have a drought period or we have a heavy rain event period. And we have underlying substrata stress on the roads and we have a whole new set of failures on these roads. Is and, that and a possibility? It is a possibility, yes, sir. And, and it. And, and you're going to have that on all roads. On any road. Yeah, yes, sir. Yeah, that's, that's that happened. It's going to happen anywhere. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Wonder it's, not the, it's, it's not the process. I'm sorry. It's not the process. You're going to have that on any road you construct uh, at 10 inch depth and at 4,000 psi or 5,000 psi. If you go through a drought period, that road will crack regardless. Uh, uh, unless we do this 47 inch pavement design. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I got so, it. So, and we had that happen on Wonderworld Drive down in San Marcos. They built on the east side of San Marcos, which is heavy clays, was an asphalt road, and actually it got too dry. And as that clay shrank, it cracked that road apart. And so the city of San Marcos had to go back in and resurface that road, and, uh, and they were not, not happy about it at all because it was brand stinking new. Got it. So... Got it. I appreciate it. Thank yes, you. Yes, sir. And I know we're coming to a close. One, one other last thing, and you guys work on roads and have for all your lives. We're doing something in our residential streets that's concrete. We could go back and use uh, blacktop asphalt, correct? You can. We can. So our asphalt, the life of an asphalt overlay as compared to some kind of this overlay, do we have any idea of what typically that would, might be differential? Five to seven years. Yeah. Typically, again, a lot depends on the weather. You I saw this last substrate. winter. We had a, a All very things being wet equal. and everything came apart. But uh, typically, you know, you, you don't get more than 10 years typically out of an asphalt. And more typically somewhere in the seven to eight year range is, right. is pretty normal under normal weather and normal traffic conditions. That, we that's about get, the most And we hope normal. to get how much out of the concrete possibly? We're hoping 20 plus. Okay. So some, somewhere in the neighborhood of double, hopefully. Ho double ho of seven might be 15. Ho so. ho hopefully, and in, 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 it's always about section. The thicker you make Correct. it, the longer it's going to last. I understand that part. But, you know, that, the alternative for the money we're spending is asphalt, in my opinion, yes. for me. And that's for me. Absolutely. So it's either that or full depth. And even with full depth, you've gone to great lengths to talk about substrata, which we can't do anything about either way. So uh, it feels like to me that we're, we're still in a process of helping out our older streets and older neighborhoods and giving them a much longer life at, at a price. So, Mr. Archer, do you have something? Thank you. I, I just want to commend everyone uh, for the evaluation of it and, uh, and appreciate it. Um, and I'm going to be the contrarian and just applaud you for the 94% success rate. Uh, when you're dealing with concrete, you're dealing with uh, Mother Nature, uh, to be able to achieve a 94% success rate is, uh, is quite commend commendable. And uh, I just appreciate everybody having the confidence in, in the folks to, to implement this process. So, and I appreciate the recommendations on how we could move forward to even mitigate that even more. And so thank you. Yeah. But good, good work. Uh, and I'll, I'll, I'll say this. A lot, of, a lot of cities hide behind consultants because they don't want to take the risk, and, and, and your staff didn't. Your staff was willing to go out there, get on the edge, apply these engineering principles, and not, not hide behind a consultant. And, and that happens at TxDOT. It happens with many cities, and uh, your staff didn't do that. And I've, I've been very impressed with their, their abilities and skills. Yes, sir. Uh, 
I'll just I'll just add, Mayor. This is this has been so important to me because the dilemma that I have struggled with since we began to have resident concerns about this process is, you know, whether it's 94 percent, and and some of our residents will have have a perception that it's more that it's worse than the 94 percent. But be that as it may, the dilemma that I struggle with every day is there are some who have seen what they believe are legitimate real concerns with the process itself and in their mindset, well, gosh, let's just do full depth replacement. Better to do it right than to do it at all. And then I've got other residents in some neighborhoods who have said, man, please don't, don't just do that because we'd rather have 90 or 94 percent than nothing. You know, so it's a difficult limit for me and I just want to make sure that we find some type of a happy medium here between you know full depth replacement which we wouldn't get very much to accomplish with but making sure that what we do uh, accomplish is going to last us in fact at least how, how many questions how many years Matt in your opinion if done right should the optimized pavement process give us for a residential neighborhood I think it's going to be 20 plus I mean you've all driven around town where a concrete truck has had its its chute open and some waste concrete fell on the roadway and uh, adhered to the roadway. And 30 years later, that blob of concrete is still stuck to, to the roadway. And, and that's just by accident, no design, no inspection, no optimized uh, concrete. We think we're going to get a, you know, we have a 94%. We're taking steps to improve that success rate. And with the, the number of streets we currently have that need this work, um, it, it, it's really the only economical way for us to, to achieve the goals of the council to, to help these residential neighborhoods and put these streets back in, in drivable condition. And just, just real quick, and this will be an ongoing watch that will have to take place year after year, ongoing watch with water, that type of thing. I think about the yes, mild sir. winters we have. We have mild winters in Texas, but there could be that hard Absolutely. winter that comes extra wet, extra hard winter, and what we could expect there. So I guess it's an ongoing watch. Absolutely, It'll be sir. Okay. Mr. Cash. Uh, thanks, Mayor. Matt, I just want to applaud you and city staff um, for uh, the hard work that we're seeing. Uh, I, we know that you put your reputation on this, that you know, our engineers put the city's reputation on this, uh, and we're seeing the, the report uh, verify and, and, and back up what you guys have been saying for many years now. Uh, the, the failure rate is good. Uh, we, we're seeing substantial savings as a result of city staff, 16 percent. Uh, and, and I just want to applaud you guys and uh, meshing the independent report with what our anecdotal experience was from the field trip that we went. Um, and seeing that the high traffic area, the areas that are exposed to uh, seeping water, uh, it, it meshes. And so I have a lot of confidence uh, going forward in this process. Good. Thank you. Thank you, Thank gentlemen. You. Thank you, Brad.